The Ethics and Legality of End-User License Agreements by Peter Dawes for IDT 555 Fall of 2024. All research done with ChatGPT, all images generated by ChatGPT, ChatGPT voice provided by naturalreaders.com, and background music generated by creators.aiva.ai. Here's a familiar situation. You're at your computer looking at a web page or something, and it wants you to register for an account. No problem. You fill out the normal info and then you see one of these, an end user license agreement. That's a lot of text. You don't have time for this. You just want to use the website. So you click agree without even reading it. So what did we just do? And how often do we do it? Let's find out by asking an expert. Hello, ChatGPT. Uh, what is a EULA in one sentence? An end user license agreement is a legal contract between a software provider and the user that outlines the terms and conditions for using the software. Are they legally binding? Yes, end user license agreements are legally binding as long as they meet the requirements of contract law, such as mutual agreement, offer and acceptance, and consideration. However, specific terms may be challenged in court if they are deemed unfair or unenforceable under local laws. How long is the average EULA? The average length of an end user license agreement typically ranges between 5,000 to 10,000 words, which is roughly 15 to 30 pages of text. Some EULAs can be even longer, depending on the complexity of the software and the legal terms included. This length often makes them difficult for users to thoroughly read before accepting. How many EULAs does the average person agree to each year? The average person agrees to around 1,500 end user license agreements each year. This estimate includes agreements for software, apps, websites, online services, and various digital products. Many of these agreements are quickly accepted without being read, as they are embedded in routine downloads, updates, and new service signups. How long would it take for the average person to read all the EULAs they agree to each year? If the average person agrees to about 1,500 EULAs each year, and considering an average EULA might be around 5,000 to 10,000 words, it could take a significant amount of time to read them all. Assuming the average adult reads at a rate of about 200 to 250 words per minute, here's a rough estimate. For a 5,000 word EULA, 20 to 25 minutes. For 1,500 EULAs, 30,000 to 37,500 minutes. This is roughly 20 to 26 days of non-stop reading annually. So, it could take about three to four weeks of full-time reading just to get through all the EULAs a person typically agrees to each year. EULAs are supposed to protect companies from misuse, like piracy. And they're enforceable, sometimes. Take ProCD Incorporated versus Zeidenberg. ProCD sued a user who had bought their virtual phone book database, which the EULA specified was for personal use, and tried to resell the data for a profit. The court sided with ProCD and upheld the EULA. That's not always the case, though. In Bragg v. Linton Research Incorporated, a Second Life user sued the company over a clause that let them shut down his account and take his virtual property. The court found that the terms of the EULA were too one-sided and ruled in favor of the user. So we can see that EULAs sit in a gray area of ethics and legality. They are definitely legally binding contracts, but when they go too far, they can be challenged in court. The thing that got me thinking about the ethics and legality of EULAs was a recent court case that was all over the news. Let's look at the details of that case. In October of 2023, husband and wife Jeffrey Piccolo and Kankapurn Tang Swan took a trip to Disneyland. While visiting Disneyland, they visited Raglan Road Irish Pub. Kankapurn has a severe nut and dairy allergy and they chose this restaurant because they thought it would have a lower chance of having nuts and dairy in the food. They report that the waitstaff repeatedly assured them that the food was nut and dairy free. They ate their meal, but then Kankapurn began to feel sick. They went to the hospital, and later that day, Kankapurn died of an allergic reaction. Jeffrey Piccolo sued Disney for $50,000 over his wife's wrongful death from an allergic reaction at the restaurant at their theme park. Disney's lawyers filed a motion asking for the case to be taken out of court and instead settled via arbitration. Why? Well, in 2019, Jeffrey had signed up for a free trial of Disney Plus streaming service. Disney's argument is that when they signed up for the Disney Plus free trial, one of the terms they agreed to was that any disputes with the company would be handled out of court and instead go through arbitration. This somewhat predictably sparked outrage online. Let's take a look at a few of the phrases that lawyers involved in the case have used to describe Disney's argument. Preposterous. Inane. Borders on the surreal. 
a weak argument. Outrageously unreasonable. So what is arbitration? Well, instead of allowing the lawsuit to proceed in court, arbitration is a legal process where disputes are settled by an impartial third party privately. Companies like Disney prefer arbitration because it happens privately instead of a well-publicized court proceeding. This gambit has worked for Disney before. In Namor v. Disney Interactive, Disney successfully had a class action lawsuit regarding technical issues with Disney Plus moved to private arbitration. Disney does have this arbitration clause prominently featured in their EULA for Disney Plus. However, Piccolo signed up for the free trial of Disney Plus four years before traveling to Disneyland with his wife. It is absurd to try and argue that the EULA he signed for a free trial of a video streaming service that lasted one month would apply to a wrongful death lawsuit at a theme park four years later. Ethically, the implied scope of an arbitration clause in a EULA for a streaming service would be limited to disputes specifically about that streaming service. The implication of Disney winning this argument would be that anyone who ever signed up for Disney Plus could not sue Disney for any reason, forever. The ironic part here is that this is such a ghoulish move by Disney that it caused media outrage, drawing a lot of public attention, which was the very reason for wanting an arbitration clause in the first place. And they definitely did not need to do this either. There is a laundry list of other arguments they could have made. The restaurant is not actually affiliated with Disney. The space is just leased to them. Also, the menu at the restaurant specifically says on it that it cannot guarantee food will not contain allergens. To use the EULA from the Disney Plus free trial was a ridiculous legal gambit, and we will never actually know if it would have worked. 18 days after the media circus their motion to move up to arbitration caused, Disney announced that they were withdrawing the motion. So if they hadn't withdrawn the motion, is there a chance this would have actually worked for Disney? Surprisingly, yes. Take a look at the case of McGinty v. Uber. The McGintys were riding in an Uber when the Uber driver ran a red light and was T-boned. The McGintys suffered severe injuries. They tried to sue Uber, and Uber successfully argued that they had agreed to settle all disputes via arbitration in the terms and conditions they agreed to. Here's where it gets ridiculous, though. Uber had added the arbitration clause after they had already signed up for the app, and had agreeing to the new terms appear as a pop-up on the app. The McGintys argued that it was actually their 12-year-old daughter who had been presented with the pop-up to agree to the new terms and conditions while she was ordering a pizza on Uber Eats. Despite this, the judge still sided with Uber and forced it to go to arbitration. If a company is going to sell software that can be misused, they obviously need to have the user agree to some terms and conditions. This on its face is both legal and ethical. But some of the cases I have described here clearly violate basic ethics. A company tried to argue that a free trial of a streaming service precluded someone from suing them over a wrongful death at a theme park. Another company successfully argued in court that a minor ordering a pizza had the ability to waive her parents' right to sue over a car accident. These stories are so upsetting because they are clearly an overreach by the companies making these EULAs, specifically forced arbitration clauses that leave consumers at a disadvantage when there are disputes. Several consumer rights advocacy groups have tried to pass laws to address this, such as the Forced Arbitration Injustice Repeal, or FAIR Act. But to date, these efforts have not been successful due to lack of bipartisan support in Congress and the Senate. For now, consumers are stuck either agreeing to these terms or simply not using the software. Knowing all this, perhaps you will do some reading before the next time you hit an agree button.